Hi, I'm Jake Archer for Brunton. You know, one of the best things about being outdoors is finding places like this. But it isn't always easy to get where you want to go, not without the right tools and the proper compass. Now, the compass has been around for hundreds of years, and there's lots of advances in navigational gear, but the ABCs of map and compass are the keys to wilderness travel and survival. Now, in this program, I'll teach you how to use a compass and how easy it is to navigate yourself in the backcountry. Let's get started by taking a closer look at a compass and how it works. The Earth is surrounded by a magnetic field to which a compass reacts. This field is centered above the Hudson Bay in Canada and is called Magnetic North. A compass uses Magnetic North as a reference point, and from this can be used to point at or cite other landmarks like mountains, trees, or man-made features. Using Magnetic North, a compass can determine your direction of travel, set a course to a destination, and find your position on a topographical map. For this DVD, we will use the Brunton 8010G compass. It's well suited for general navigation and map planning. Although many compasses have slightly different features, the 8010 will be used throughout the program. The base plate, or bottom of the compass, is used to hold the compass stable when taking a bearing and features several scales along the edges to help measure distances on a map. This model also features a built-in magnifier to provide a closer look at smaller map details. The travel arrow down the middle of the base plate is used to indicate the direction of travel and to point at or sight nearby landmarks. The azimuth ring is the white rotating dial that is marked from 0 to 360 degrees in 2 degree increments. It also shows the cardinal headings for north, south, east and west. These compass directions are measured just like a circle, with 0 degrees representing north. As you move clockwise around the dial, east is represented by the 90 degree mark, south as 180 degrees, and west as 270 degrees. The declination scale is generally located on the inside of the azimuth ring and is marked in two degree increments to adjust for deviation from true north. The vial holds the magnetized needle and is liquid filled to provide quick, accurate readings. The red side of the needle always points to magnetic north. The bottom of the vial also features a red and black orienting arrow that is used to align the azimuth ring to the proper orientation with a magnetic needle or magnetic north. When you hold a compass level, the red needle will rotate freely, always pointing to one single direction, magnetic north. Because we know the needle will always point to magnetic north, we can use it to find the direction from there to any other place we can see. We'll tell you how to do that in just a second. But first, one very important point of caution. Since a compass is a magnet, it can be affected by other metal objects, electronic devices, and other compasses. If the metal object gets too close to the compass, it can affect the outcome of the needle, giving you inaccurate information. So be sure to keep pocket knives, belt buckles, and metal objects a safe distance away. Now that we've learned the parts of a compass, let's move on to taking a bearing. A bearing is the number of degrees or direction from north to an object. Now once a bearing is established, you can use that information to navigate and find your position in the field or on a map. Bearings are measured in degrees, just like a circle. Let's say I wanted to find the direction or bearing from where I'm standing now to that tree where my backpack is over there. The first thing I do is I hold my compass level with the travel arrow pointed away from my body. Hold the compass in a position where you can read it easily. Next, I'll move my entire body towards the object. Don't just point your hand. Rotate the azimuth ring until the red orienting arrow is aligned with the red needle. This aligns the compass with the directions printed on the azimuth ring, so make sure you're holding the compass level and the arrows are lined up. We can now read the direction to my backpack by reading the index line on the travel arrow back to the scale on my azimuth ring. Now, right now, the compass tells us we're about 214 degrees from the north in a southwesterly direction. Let's try another. Let's take a different bearing in a different direction, maybe to that peak on the ridge over there. Remember to turn your entire body with the compass and sight the landmark within the travel arrow as accurately as possible. Now let's use the azimuth ring to line things up again. Now I see that the bearing to the peak reads at about 134 degrees. Once you've got the hang of sighting a visible landmark, you can repeat the same steps to locate or navigate using a map, which we'll learn about later. Now that we've learned how to use a compass in the field, let's learn about a different, important navigational tool, the topographical map. 
One of the most important elements of a successful navigation is to plan your trip before you even head outdoors. The best way to get a lay of the land is by using a map. Now, there's all kinds of different maps, from road maps to atlases, gazetteers, and topos. Now, whatever kind of map you use, it won't do you any good to just go through it without even learning how to read it. So take the time to get to know your topo. Use the symbols and terminology and coordinate systems. Map reading is an essential tool. It could keep you found, and it could save your life. The basic map used for most outdoor navigation is the U.S. Geological Survey's 1 to 24,000 scale topographical map. This type of map is also referred to as a quadrangle and covers an area of around 6.5 by 8.5 miles. A topographical map represents a three-dimensional picture of the land as it would be seen from overhead. The map shows a variety of features using colors and symbols. Vegetation and forested areas are shown in green, while lakes, streams, and rivers are shown in blue. Any man-made features such as roads, buildings, and towers are indicated in black. The brown lines represent elevation or the contour of the land. Contour lines are used to show the elevation, form of the land, and indicate how steep or flat it is. The closer the contour lines, the steeper the slope. The contour lines allow you to get a graphic picture of what the land looks like from the ground and will help you determine the best path. The bottom of the map features a legend which indicates the map scale, contour interval, and the magnetic declination. At the top of the map, the area covered and the map name are shown, along with the latitude and longitude of each corner of the map. The latitude and longitude references allow you to define any position on the map and are handy references to enter into a GPS receiver. As you can see, the topo map is a great way to get a mental picture of your surroundings. And after a little practice, you'll be able to quickly find trailheads, peaks, valleys, and other points of interest to make your trip more successful. Also, getting familiar with the contour lines on the map is a great way to try and get around rough or impassable terrain. But before we start planning our trip using a map and a compass, it's important we touch on one more very crucial point, magnetic declination. Declination is the difference between true north, which maps are drawn to, and magnetic north, which is what the magnetic needle of a compass points to. True north is represented by the geographic north pole, while magnetic north is located near the top of the Hudson Bay. If you are simply taking bearings in the field without reference to a map, it is usually not necessary to adjust for declination, as your bearings are all in reference to magnetic north. However, magnetic declination must be accounted for when using a map in the field, or you may find drastic errors in your bearings and position calculations. The difference in true north and magnetic north is measured in degrees east or west. In areas where true north and magnetic north align, the declination would be zero. If the magnetic needle of a compass points west of true north, the difference would be called west declination. If it points east of true north, it is called east declination. Declination is shown on most topographical maps using a declination diagram in the bottom left-hand corner of the map. The diagram shows an arrow representing true north, grid north, and magnetic north. The angle and direction of declination is indicated in degrees next to the magnetic north arrow. If the declination diagram does not appear on the map, look for a numeric value of declination in the map legend. Since declination varies from year to year, it's also a good idea to use an updated map or check the Brunton or USGS website for the latest declination values. Adjusting this Brunton compass for declination is easy and it doesn't require any special tools. Here's how it works. First, find your angle of declination on your map. For this map, I have 11 degrees. And because this map shows magnetic north to the right of true north, I know I have an east declination. Now hold the compass by the azimuth ring and turn the vial with your other hand. Use the red orienting arrow to point the declination scale on the inside of the azimuth ring. Since the scale is in two degree increments, we'll start at the end and move it five and a half lines to the right, or the east side of the scale. Now our compass is ready to use at our current location with this particular map. Our needle will point to magnetic north, but all of our bearings will represent true north values, just like our map. If you're using a different compass, check your Ono's manual before setting your declination. To use the map and compass together, the first thing I need to do is turn the map so that everything is in the right perspective. We call this orienting the map. The easiest way to do this is with the compass. 
With the declination adjusted for, rotate the N, or zero value, of the azimuth ring to intersect with the travel arrow. Next, place the edge of the base plate along the side margin of the map, with the travel arrow pointing directly north. Finally, we'll rotate the map and compass together until the red magnetic needle aligns with the orienting arrow. Now that the map is oriented north, I can easily compare what I see on my map to my physical surroundings. Today I'm headed out for a short day hike to an alpine lake I spotted on my map. But before I get started, I'm going to plot my course. Using a map and compass, it's as easy as A, B, C. A, align my compass. B, read the bearing. And C, set a course. Since I've already found my declination and I've aligned my map, I can find my bearing by lining up my compass base plate with my position here at camp and the lake. Make sure the travel arrow is pointing in the direction of the destination. Next, I'll find the bearing by rotating the azimuth ring so the orienting arrow and the magnetic needle are aligned. Once we're set, I can read the bearing by reading where the direction of the travel arrow intersects the azimuth scale. It looks like right now we're at 109 degrees. My final step is to set a course. Now, to follow a course, I'll hold my compass level so the red arrow floats freely. Then I'll move my body. Don't just swing your arm. Keep it stationary so the red orienting needle lines up with the red orienting arrow. Once you're lined up, you can use the travel arrow to guide us to our destination. But make sure you're always traveling in the same direction that the arrow is pointing. If you head off sideways, you'll get off track before you even get started. That's all there is to it. If you're interested in seeing some more advanced methods of using a map and compass together, be sure to visit our website, brunton.com, for additional information. Let's get ready to head to our destination. Since I can't see the lake from where I'm standing, I know that Tolman Peak is on the same bearing from here to the lake. So if I use Tolman Peak as a visual reference, I can use it to maintain my path along the way. Let's get started. When making your way through the backcountry, it's important to put your observation skills to good use. Make a mental note of distinguishable landmarks and trail deviations and stop to look back at the trail several times. Since using a compass and a map relies on visual references, the more details you can remember, the more successful you'll be. Well, we've made it. My compass and my map got me here. And let me tell you, it's worth it. But I've had a time to take a look at the view, and I've had time to get a bite to eat, so it's time to head back. But before we do, we need to take a look around. We're heading in a different direction, so things will look a little bit differently. The first thing we need to do is align our map to our position, just like we did back at camp. We're here at the lake. Here's the original bearing line we used to get here. Now, on the way back, our direction of travel will be exactly the opposite, or 180 degrees from our original bearing. This is called a back bearing, and it's easily seen by looking at the opposite side of the compass dial. In this case, the back bearing is 290 degrees. I'll reset my compass to the new heading, and we'll be ready to go. On our way in, Tolman Peak served right in our line of direction and was a great point of reference for us. On the way back, there won't be anything like that, so we're going to have to use a different technique called intermediate bearings to get us right in our direction. To use intermediate bearings, all you need to do is cite another point of reference along the path to your destination and break the trip into smaller segments without having to watch the compass every step of the way. That will also let us watch our footing and take in the scenery as we go. Intermediate bearings are especially useful in poor visibility and rough terrain. You can use trees or rocks. But for now, I'm going to use that dead pine tree on the other side of the lake as my first intermediate bearing and take another one when I get there. I'm making really good time, but I just noticed a spot over here that I'm going to check out as a campsite for the future. So I'm going to break away and do a little exploring. But when you leave the trail, it's always important to make a mental note of where you went off in case you want to come back. So I've gotten a little off course and it's time that I head back so I can make it to camp before dark. But I'm not sure exactly where I am, so I'm going to get out my map and find out my current location. Once I figure out exactly where I am, I can shoot a bearing back to camp or to my original line of travel. The technique we use for this is called triangulation, and it works by taking the bearings of three known objects from our present position and marking them on our map. The first step is to take out the map and orient it to our location. 
Then we'll take a look to see if we can find some usable landmarks as reference points on the map and take a bearing to them here in the field. Let's give it a shot. My first step is to take a bearing for my first landmark, in this case, Tolman Peak. Now, when taking a bearing, it's important to zero in on a specific area, not just a broad area. When doing this, it'll help you make a more accurate prediction and get you to where you want to go much, much easier. In this case, I'll use the front rock slide there on the peak. Next, we'll place the edge of the compass on the landmark's position on the map. With the travel arrow pointed in the same direction as the landmark, pivot the compass keeping the edge on the landmark until the red side of the compass needle is aligned with the orienting arrow. We'll use the edge of the compass to plot the bearing line on the map. We know that our position is somewhere along this line. And to get a better idea of where we are, all we need to do is repeat the steps of that process to get a cross bearing. In this case, let's use Black Pyramid Mountain. Now we'll follow the same steps to plot the bearing line on the map. Notice that the second bearing line crosses the first bearing line right here, which theoretically represents our location on the map. Since finding a visual bearing isn't an exact science, we run the risk of errors in finding our location. So to narrow it down a bit, all we have to do is take a final reading. We'll use that sharp peak back there. When we plot out the line, you can see that we've created a small triangle on the map. If we've done a good job taking accurate bearings, we can be sure that our position is somewhere within this triangle. The smaller the triangle, the better we did. If you end up with an unusually large triangle, you may have made a mistake. Try it again. Ours looks pretty good, so let's see about getting back to camp. We know that we're here, and we know our bearing, but there's some pretty difficult terrain in the middle, so we're going to try to get back to our original course. Getting back to our original line of travel requires another compass technique called navigating to a baseline. Throughout the DVD, we've seen how you can take a bearing to a landmark by drawing an imaginary line to your destination. This line is known as a baseline. Now, a baseline can be a compass line that you've drawn on your map, or it can also be a natural landmark, like a river, road, or even a power line. Baselines are also great reference points. If you park your car, for example, on a road that runs north and south, and you hike west, you simply have to hike east to get back to the road. Using a baseline is also a very important tool when trying to get around an obstruction or an obstacle, like this lake that you can't walk through. First, you need to pick two distinguished landmarks, one on each side of the lake. The first will use this willow tree here. The second one will use the rock on the other side of the shore. And it's important to pick an obstacle that's large enough so that you can see it. And here we are. We want to confirm our original direction of travel by taking a back bearing to our original landmark on the other side of the lake. This is called back sighting, and it's a useful technique to use when you want to confirm your direction of travel. Whenever you're back sighting, you don't need to adjust the azimuth ring. Just sight the landmark and see if the white side of the compass needle lines up with the orienting arrow. Since we'll be using the compass backwards, we need to remember the only time to use the white side of the needle is when we are back sighting, and we don't want to reset the azimuth ring. Now that I know I'm back on my original course, I can continue on my bearing back to camp. Thanks for watching Brunton's ABCs of Compass and Map. I'm going to kick back and cook a little dinner and get prepared for another day. We'll see you on the trail. Thank you.